looking here on uh, universality of access. We're trying to take a look here at how far we, we're at in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, everyone on the planet is connected. And uh, we have a, a quite an interesting uh, selection of panelists here to give us their experience uh, in this area. Um, I'll leave them to introduce themselves uh, more fully. But we have uh, T.R. Mori from the Pisces Project in Micronesia. Uh, we have Pitaka from uh, Air Puti here in Indonesia. And we have Jennifer Haroon from Google. And Bernadette Lewis from the uh, Caribbean Telecommunications uh, Union in, in the Caribbean. So we have a quite a diverse area. And uh, n note that of particular interest we have... Uh, many people from the areas which are the least connected, which are the small islands and, and uh, least developed countries. And I think this is where our biggest challenge is uh, because uh, internet access is still generally quite expensive for the bottom of the pyramid, as it were. Um, the current uh, definition coming out of the ITU and the Broadband Commission is that uh, internet access should cost about, uh, or ideally less than 5% of your annual income. Uh, and when we look at uh, places like Africa, it's uh, probably about 40% or 50% of your uh, annual income. So in terms of affordability, we have a huge issue there. Um, and that's for a, a general broadband connection, obviously. And that's another part of the issue, is what constitutes uh, being connected. Uh, is, is a slow GPRS connection on your mobile phone sufficient um, or do we need a um, 100 megabits connection like many people do in, in some of the more developed parts of the world. So there's a range of issues there around the speed of connections, the affordability of connections and then of course the coverage of connectivity. Um, in many areas of the world, uh, even in developed countries, we're seeing um, people in rural areas still having a lot of difficulty getting connected. Um, I spent some of the summer visiting some parts of Ireland and uh, the UK in, in some of the rural areas there. Uh, it's still impossible to even get a, a mobile signal coverage. Uh, uh, and the same problem is, is much more magnified in, in the developing countries. Um, urban areas are getting better coverage, uh, but still probably quite expensive and, and uh, quite a lot slower than they would be in the developed world. Um, but then in the uh, rural areas, we, ha we have even basic middle mile problems with, with uh, national backbones not being pervasive. And then we have the uh, last mile connectivity problem, especially in remote areas where the topography may make it even harder to um, connect. And then, of course, we may have exclusion uh, not on a geographic basis, but it may be cultural groups or, in many cases, uh, gender-based uh, um, divergences in access levels. So uh, there are a number of different factors here, and I'd like to invite the panel to uh, give us their experiences in these different areas. And perhaps we should just uh, run through the panel from uh, right to left, as it were. And could I start with you, Bernadette? Thank you. And just uh, give me a little bit more background about your personal role. Thank you very much, Mike, and good afternoon to everyone. My, my name is Bernadette Lewis. I'm the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. It is an intergovernmental organization with 20 member states, and we do have uh, private sector organizations as well, and civil society as members. We are have sort of created a multi-stakeholder environment uh, for the formulation of policy for the development of the ICT uh, sector in the region. Now, the thing I should say, start by saying, is that the Caribbean is very diverse, very diverse. And um, you have countries with uh, Internet usage per, per population in, in excess of 80%, and others at the other spectrum of the scale um, with less than 10 percent. So it is tremendously diverse. There are different stages of development. So I, I, I can't speak to averages because it, it, it doesn't re really make sense. So I will try to give some uh, examples about what's being done in different countries just for you to get a, an idea of the whole issue of um, access, Internet access and so on. Um, 
there are many programs within the region, and I could give you a very specific example. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has plans to open a number of computer access uh, centers, and this is going to be other countries are doing similar things as well. Uh, universal service funds are being earmarked for broadband, uh, broadband connectivity. Uh, many of the countries in the region are also in the process of developing broadband strategies. But I want to just point to one concern of mine is that more attention needs to be uh, given to people with disabilities, to seniors and to people who are institutionalized. They are part of this uh, universality that we are going after, and I think too often they are overlooked. They are invisible in many respects. So uh, those are my, just my opening points. I'm just going to pass on now. Thanks, Bernadette. My name is Jennifer Haroon, and I work on the Access team at Google. And um, I think I've said this before, some of you may have heard me say this, but you know, universal access is a very large problem, and it's not one for which we believe there's any one solution technologically and also when you think about policies, and that any one player can solve. Um, and so we work on a variety of things um, to try to address this challenge. One is on the technology side, so developing technologies that may be able to bring access to more people and also bring down the cost structure of access. And then that really needs to be supported by a strong policy foundation that enables those technologies to do their work. And as part of that, we joined the Alliance for Affordable Internet, which is a relatively new organization hosted by the World Wide Web Foundation, 30-plus um, organizations, including civil society, other private companies, governments, and nonprofits are part of this organization that's really looking at a set of policy best practices that enable a, a government to support a more affordable Internet. Um, and as part of that, they'll be publishing an affordability report later this year talking about how countries are doing against that set of policy um, practices. And then the last thing we look at is really the whole Internet ecosystem. A little bit of what Bernadette mentioned is trying to make um, the Internet useful for everyone, inclusive to, to all, all people. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon, everyone. <coughs> My name is Pataka. I'm from uh, Air Putti Foundation. Uh, this foundation was established in 2005 during the uh, tsunami in Aceh. And recently we have uh, many projects in uh, rural area connecting the unconnected people that are not uh, have the internet access that uh, can benefit to their uh, life. And we have uh, many experience uh, and found many facts that uh, in this area, people not only need an access or the availability of technology, but more than that, they need assistance to utilize the technology to, uh, as a benefit to their life in daily activity. So this is most important thing, I think, uh, uh, from our perspective, from our experience during these years. And this is what uh, the government and also many uh, many initiatives not aware or they are not really care about the situation because most of the program like universal service obligation and any other uh, initiative are only deploying uh, the technology without concerning about the uh, culture of the people uh, they are not care about what the people really need. Sometimes they are not uh, need the internet or the technology itself, but they only need a help to utilize this uh, technology uh, as a benefit for their uh, community. So this is uh, 
what uh, perspective we want to share with you in this uh, discussion today. I think that is uh, from me. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is T.R. Mori from uh, iSolutions Micronesia, a private sector that sometimes think we're a nonprofit. Uh, for those not familiar with Micronesia, it's the body of water between um, Hawaii and Philippines. If you have Google Maps uh, open up right now, you won't see anything. Um, and in Chuk, my home state, one of the um, group of islands in Micronesia, we have about 40 plus inhabited islands, um, only one of which has the basic infrastructure, um, island power, water, sewage, and internet, via a satellite feed, um, totaling about 15 megs, oversold a few times. Um, so if you look at that map, you can see all the water there and just imagine um, little dots scattered across Micronesia um, and in Chuk with our um, situation. Uh, no other islands next to the main island has um, island power or those basic infrastructure. So um, our our hobby um, outside our nine to five job is we like to do rural deployments. Um, so we have to think really basic things from borrowing that link. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everything from scratch. We cannot assume that um, they have long towers on the island or we'd have to scope everything out from the ground, building, you know, even trees sometimes. Um, travel 165 miles sometimes and we also look at uh, places that are not currently feasible connecting uh, wireless point to points um, some 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 of the schools are um, getting these small VSAT satellites um, RIC system rural internet connectivity systems and those are for our region it's the lowest bandwidth we can get is 395 a month. Um, that's after buying all the equipment. So that's not very feasible for us. Um, total population is about 46, uh, maybe 50 on a good day. Um, so and they're all scattered in the 40 plus um, islands. So uh, the we have one ISP there. And they're mainly on the the main island, and that's why we like to um, help out and uh, shoot the last mile, so that uh, all those unconnected are at least have a a single point on their island to connect up if they need. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, the panel. Um, maybe we would, could invite any reactions to the presentations uh, from the panel, and I'll uh, take the uh, moderator's uh, license and, and uh, uh, just ask a couple of questions of clarification, if I may. Um, I was particularly interested in um, the statements from Pataka about um, that people some people may not even need the internet and people's actual needs are not taken into consideration and I think that this is an interesting point that's not very often drawn out uh, people just assume that everyone needs the internet and they have to have it and so I'd like to perhaps ask you to elaborate a little bit on that and uh, uh, give us some more details about uh, what, what do you think what you found the people there to really need and what the priorities are I think and an interesting general observation that comes out from uh, the Micronesia uh, situation is the, the basic needs for other forms of infrastructure, which I think also uh, ties into that. And at the same time, though, um, 
many, in many cases you can uh, make use of basic infrastructure de deployment such as electricity or water pipelines to include the deployment of, of internet access so that it can be cheaper to deploy. Um, and I know I'd just like to ask TR to explain what he meant uh, when he said uh, the population, and as far as I understood, is at 50,000 scattered across 40 islands. Uh, is that about right? Okay. Thank you. I think you have a microphone there. Okay. I, I will give you uh, some example. Uh, during our experience in many uh, devastated areas, it's similar to uh, the situation in the uh, Yuso area. The people are, uh, they're not really, um, they never going out from their villages. They all, the people they know are there. So they doesn't really need the communication, internet and so on. But, um, Sometimes they often uh, need something to facilitate uh, 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 the problem there. For example, in Papua, we have a community that are concerned in uh, uh, illegal illegal logging. Yeah, uh, if you put the internet uh, connection there. There's a problem with electricity. It would not fit with their needs. Yeah. Even you have the uh, VSAT station, but there is no electricity. There is a base transmission system uh, from some uh, cellular provider, but there is no electricity. They only uh, start it uh, six hours a day. Yeah. Then there is a, we call it a charging station because everybody will need to connect it to the outside and they have to come to that station and charge their mobile phone and they're connected to the BTS. That's the problem. So people are really need, don't really need that uh, equipment or that technology, but they need uh, something to support them to uh, locate where is the exact place of the uh, uh, illegal logging. So that is the common enemy in, in that community. Because uh, last time in Wasior, in uh, uh, West Papua, uh, there's a flood because of this illegal logging that uh, 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 swipe up all of the villages. So they really need who is doing that uh, nasty things. And we equip them with a GPS and then equip them with uh, cell phones that are only... Uh, can send an SMS. They just copy the uh, the coordinate of the uh, 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 GPS and then send it right after they arrive in the uh, BTS area. So that's the uh, that's the technology they are need, not the uh, internet something. Yeah. So you can see we have to start from the bottom up perspective, not the top-down perspective, because of the top-down perspective like uh, USO uh, program, they always uh, same uh, scheme. For example, putting some uh, uh, telephone, uh, satellite telephone and or uh, VSAT station, and then they hope that people will use it. And the, the fact is not, because they are not really need that equipment. But they need more. Uh, than that, the uh, uh, assistant to use the proper technology to uh, feed their needs. That's the example. Uh, um, my colleague here has just raised a very important issue, appropriate technology. It isn't necessarily that you need all the bells and whistles, everything. It is what works well for you and, uh, and is able to help you in overcoming some, some challenge. Um, the, he raised another issue that I thought I, I would speak to, the whole issue of awareness and education. People may not have been exposed to whatever the technology is, but that doesn't mean that they cannot necessarily use it. You have to raise awareness and educate uh, people 
about the value of the technology <clears throat> in the context of what they do so that there is, they understand the relevance of the technology and, and are able to appreciate how to use it effectively to overcome the challenges that, that they encounter on a daily basis. So there is a, a need for public awareness and education um, about the technologies and how they could be effectively incorporated in the context of what people do, whether they are in a mining area or a logging area or a fishing area. And uh, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, <coughs> excuse me, we have a, a program called, which we call the Caribbean ICT Roadshow. It seeks to educate uh, the widest cross-section of, of, of citizens in a particular Caribbean country on the technology and in language that they understand and in the context of what they do. So we go out to fisher folk, we go out to the farmers, we demonstrate technologies that many of them already have and show them how they could incorporate it in what they do on a daily basis to improve the quality of their lives. And we have found this to be very effective. As practitioners, we tend to take things for granted. We really take things for granted and assume that people know and understand and there is a collective need for operators, uh, service providers, for, for governments, for regulators, for the private sector to contribute to this process of education and public awareness. Well, thanks for that intervention, uh, Bernadette. Uh, do you have any other f reactions from the panel before we open to the floor? I have another to share that. Um, most of the after the after uh, around uh, a decade of the implementation of universal service obligation in Indonesia, we found out that most of them are failed to achieve their uh, target or uh, its purpose because of uh, the people are not really care about the uh, uh, the equipment or the technology they are deployed there. So uh, based on that experience, we. Uh, that's the example of the top-down approach. Uh, they are not, will not fit uh, to the uh, situation in the community. So we have to uh, uh, to have a, a workaround in the uh, uh, approach uh, uh, from the uh, bottom-up perspective. Let's start from the uh, community, from the people perspective. Uh, thanks very much, Pataka. Um, perhaps at this point we should uh, invite any uh, comments or questions from the floor. Uh, there's a gentleman over here and a lady at the back. Thank you. Thank you. Is it on? Cool, thanks. Um, this is a question posed to Bernadette. I work for the South African Human Rights Commission, and I just wanted some more. Oh, it's oh, there we go. I said this is a question posed to Bernadette. Um, I work at the South African Human Rights Commission. So hello, Mike. <laughs> and I just have a question in relation to the comment you made right at the start. And more attention needs to be more attention needs to be given to persons with disabilities, older persons, and those. I think you said in mental institutions. And I was just hoping if you could elaborate, because those are generally the most vulnerable, including children, in our society. So, in terms of access, just to thrash out exactly what that means within sort of a rights-based context. Thank you. Right, um, a blind person. Uh, cannot necessarily, cannot, well definitely can't see. If you give them a computer, it doesn't help them. There must be tools and applications that enable them to use these facilities. And unfortunately, uh, <coughs> and uh, we have found that the disabled in our region tend to be invisible. 
and I, I'm going to speak from a personal point of view. Um, I, I recently had to take charge of my parents, two seniors, very, very frail. And a lot of the, the challenges that disabled people would have, it, it, it was in my face. And then you started recognizing, okay, someone who is hearing impaired, they cannot use a telephone because they're not hearing. And I, I, and I lived through that process. So there are applications and bits of equipment that can be used to enhance their experience and enable them to use these technologies. So uh, people with disabilities, yes, yeah, so, so there are ICT tools uh, that would certainly assist in improving the quality of the lives for people with disabilities. I spoke to seniors. There are many, many um, seniors in, in homes, in institutions, completely isolated from their families. And I could give you another example. I have a, 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 an elderly relative in, in the UK, and the last time I visited him, I showed him how to use Skype. And that has transformed his life, his experience. He's no longer isolated. I could check up on him. What is that bump on your head? I, he fell down, you know. And it, it improves the quality of life because they're not isolated. Um, I spoke about <clears throat> people in institutions. Sometimes you have children in hospitals, long stay. Right? Out of children out of the schooling system. The ICTs present an opportunity for them to continue their education. But the structures have to be put in place. The policies have, have to be there. Uh, the appropriate technology to the situ for the situation, for the environment, must be put in place. So, but I think that these groups, I wanted to make special mention of them because they're often, too often overlooked. And I think that ICT's access to the uh, ICT facilities, access to the Internet, can have a tremendous impact on the quality of their lives and keeping them engaged. Uh, one of the challenges for seniors is isolation. And I've seen it. And you want to be able to keep them engaged and enable them to make a con contribution in one way or another, and to keep in touch. And this, this helps, you know, in terms of just making them feel part of, of, of a community. So those are my comments. I hope it answers your question. Uh, thanks very much, Bernadette. The gentleman here in the check shirt. Mark, Mark Summer was in Benio. Um, we're a non-profit organization. We work a lot on last mile issues in uh, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, but actually we work as well in, in Micronesia um, with TR and his team. I wanted to um, address for a moment the point um, the gentleman from Indonesia brought up around appropriateness of tools and how to adapt tools to the needs of, of um, the individuals ultimately who we're trying to serve. And I think that's a very important point to look at how can we adopt the tools and apply them to the needs. But I think at the same time, I want to be maybe a little bit contrarian for a moment here, that some of these things we're doing because the tools are way too expensive or the bandwidth itself is way too expensive. If we need to have a satellite backhaul to get to a rural place, we need to contort ourselves in a way to reduce the bandwidth consumption as much as possible. And that often, I see in part, leads to unsustainable tools because they're only used in a very remote place where there's no proper support for them, and they'll never actually scale up. On the other hand, I've very seldom seen when actually the cost of Internet connectivity is very low that no one comes to use it. People come to use it and experiment with it and then find the solutions they need for their own problems. But the problem is if your pricing is so high that it's prohibitive for a vast majority to get access to it, you don't get the local buy-in because you don't get the local experimentation and adaption. And I think that's really what made, going back for a second to the disability discussion actually, what made huge leaps in, in the markets where Afford, where connectivity is affordable, that everyone is experimenting of how can we include other groups who aren't as easy um, being able to use 
the connectivity now vastly available and how can we experiment with may it be things like Skype or may it be with services which need more bandwidth to really connect those disenfranchised um, populations with the rest of the community. Um, so in part, I, I think ultimately the affordability problem is the one which needs to be cracked and, and a lot of other things will fall out of this because we need local people in their communities who know their problems best to figure out the solutions for them. And that's, um, I think, really what we can focus on as, as, as a whole community at the IGF. How can we get those communities connected so they can actually take charge of their own destiny and apply those tools to their best uses in their case? Thanks, Mark. I think that's a very relevant uh, point, and Jennifer would like to say something. Thanks, Mark. And I, I think to add on to that, one of the things that we think about um, is also what type of Internet access to bring. Um, and so when you, if, if you restrict or are only bringing Internet access maybe for one uh, particular use case rather than bringing full Internet access, then you do miss that opportunity to engage the whole ecosystem um, for local entrepreneurs or local developers to build those tools and then enable the community to use them. And so we really see, you know, oftentimes we talk about um, wanting to bring Internet access because of access to health information or educational materials, and all of those are completely true. Um, but also sometimes people just want to use the Internet for entertainment um, or to communicate to each other. And so I think when you... I agree that the affordability issue is sort of the very tough one that needs to be solved because when you can bring that full Internet experience, you don't really know what it will be used for. And it's up to the local community to then come up with those solutions and ideas and, and everything else, the content and everything that's going to be used. Um, I just also want to share... Uh, uh, a situation where we uh, installed a um, satellite system. It was pretty expensive, 395 so a month. So we were kind of hesitant to uh, install it in the different other islands. Um, it was in the planning stage. Um, we talked to the uh, leaders, um, told them the price, and um, you know, uh, worked with them to try to find identify funding and and such and. Um, maybe after six months, uh, we, after we put in the RIC system, um, everybody still talks on the ham radio out there. So um, I was actually surprised that uh, they had a meeting with, um, we're naturally travelers um, because, you know, you get crazy if you're stuck on one small island. So communication is very important for us. Um, people can spend all day on ham radios, and um, they came up with a solution to connect their little group of island uh, northwest of Chup um, by via that one satellite uh, connection, and they call people from outside, um, say people that are interested in helping uh, with their education system, and then they just simply press the ham, ham radio and, you know, all the communication reached all the other islands that didn't have that way to communicate. So, um, yeah, I think uh, sometimes we underestimate um, how the local people will actually use that technology. So for us, it's really important to put that opportunity there and then help help guide them um, on ways to use, but never limit how you can use it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I have to continue. Uh, I agree with Mark uh, that continuity is a big challenge because of uh, on our experience, we see that many deployment in this uh, initiative are mostly they are using uh, many things or many solutions that are not really needed by the uh, community. For example, you say that uh, the people sometimes just need a radio communication, not the internet. 
And in the most area, we see that community radio, uh, the broadcasting system, are still needed rather than the uh, internet access. Uh, uh, and it doesn't mean that internet is not uh, is useless or they are not need uh, an internet. Sometimes internet are needed, but not like we all here expecting the internet do. For example, if you refer to the uh, entertainment here, maybe you expect to see YouTube or something, or downloading a movie or something. But for local people, for the, those community, uh, uh, entertainment is just like uh, another thing, not like that. Just very simple. For example, maybe they just want to see some uh, uh, some picture of certain area. For example, uh, Eiffel Tower in Paris or something. That's the entertainment for them because they cannot see those things uh, in the in their uh, activity. Yeah. So we how we can bring those uh, appropriate technology to, for them for their needs but not expecting uh, more than that. Because if you expecting more, then you will need more bandwidth, you will need more technology, you will need more energy or uh, power system or something. It will not last for them because after the program, after the budget is run out, after people are leaving, they will back to the Stone Age. <laughs> so that's the problem. So we have to uh, put more uh, sustainable and affordable, but not from our perspective, but from the people perspective. Thank you. Uh, we've got two questions, uh, Emila and then the gentleman on the left, on the right. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Emila Uche, and I work with uh, APC. Um, most of you on the panel talked about universal access, affordable access, reliable, equal access. Is it the same thing? Is it different things? What does it really mean? Uh, maybe you've talked about it already, but I just want to know what, what it really means when you say universal access. What does it really mean when you say affordable access? And do we have to prioritize any of these? Can I have... Um, maybe reliable, uh, no, affordable access, which is not really reliable, or what is it that we need to uh, prioritize on this? Um, or maybe we don't need to prioritize anything, but something that I really want to understand. And the second thing is, what do we need to do for us to, to have this access, whether it's universal, whether it's reliable? What, what strategies do we need to, to put in place? Thank you. Many issues. Um, the, if we looked over the, the history, um, universal access has been a, an evolving uh, issue. At one time, when we spoke about universal access, it was access to a telephone or a payphone or, or, or a, 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 a telephone within X miles. It is, it is an evolutionary process as the technology evolves. Um, at this stage, we are talking, well, I should speak perhaps for, from the Caribbean's point of view, we are looking at broadband uh, access, um, personal, uh, so that at least in a, if, if you don't have access to broadband from your home, then there should be access through a community access point. Uh, so it, it, it really is up for the, each jurisdiction, each, each region, each country to define what you are talking about when you say universal access. As I said, the Caribbean is a very diverse region so that uh, the expectations in the different countries are going to be different. But ultimately, you want to be heading down a progressive part of ad, path of advancement um, so that each country, region may need to uh, give a definition of what 
the expectation is when you say universal access. Otherwise, it gets very difficult to plan and uh, make uh, progress towards realizing a goal if you haven't defined it. Uh, affordable access. And, and that would have to do with uh, perhaps the... Uh, it, it, the, the, uh, I think some industry standards in terms of what percentage of your earning of your of your earnings will go into uh, communications and those things also you need to look at those on a case by case basis. Uh, so so I, I think I've captured two. There was a third point that I think I. I reliable access. Of course, the quality of the experience, once you've defined what, you, what you're speaking of when you're talking about access and if it's broadband, what those standards are, the quality of the experience must also be defined. And that has to be uh, written into your policies and your regulations so that if you are not getting the quality for which you, you, which you expect, then there must be some re recourse through some process, through your regulator, through somebody where you could complain and demand, I am not getting the level of service, the reliability, or whatever service it is, whatever parameters have been established. Uh, you need to be able to have some recourse. So if your service is unreliable, then surely you must be able to go to your regulator and, and there must be a whole process by which you address the fact that your service is unreliable. So I, I, for the Alliance for Affordable Internet, in terms of defining affordability, they use that same broadband commission um, definition of access not costing more than 5% of um, monthly GNI. And that's a really large goal. Um, in most of the US and Western Europe, um, the average cost of access is about 1% to 2% of monthly GNI. So that's like uh, maybe your daily coffee run. Um, whereas in many emerging markets, the average is about 30%. And in 17 countries, it costs on average over 100% of monthly GNI to access the internet. So reaching that Broadband Commission's goal is, is definitely a, a um, large challenge. Um, in terms of defining, I think, reliability and, and what is broadband, I think the way I think about it as it's at its simplest is you want people to be able to do what they want on the internet when they want. Um, and so rather than define a specific um, speed at which they should be receiving um, their bandwidth, it, it's really about being able to engage on the Internet at the level that a user wants to. And, and that may be for some very, very little um, and for other, others quite a bit. Um, I think part of the question was also what types of things need to be done to then reach this goal of both affordable and reliable um, internet. And I think as part of the alliance, they've really laid out a number of policies that governments should think about. And they, they are very wide ranging. So for instance, having a competitive liberalized market where there's um, competitive offers in terms of where people can access the internet, that has really proven to be one of the drivers of cost um, but it also can include things like the cost of building out an Internet infrastructure. So, for example, I was recently in Nigeria, and there the um, about 70% of every dollar spent in laying fiber infrastructure goes to rights of way and local taxes. That's extremely high compared to most other places, and so that also drives the cost of Internet. There's also the cost of devices. A lot of countries impose a luxury tax on devices. Um, someone earlier today said similar to what other countries would impose a sin tax, so similar to alcohol or tobacco, those extra taxes are all passed down to the customer. Yeah, uh, I have another comment that the key of affordability is expectation. 
the if we can uh, if we can assess the what is exactly the people expect, expectation we can deliver more affordable uh, services or solution for example in many area we are working with the uh, everybody uh, need an internet connection but not like we are using here for example everybody here connected to the internet through their laptops but in the same time they are connecting their gadget yeah and everybody using more than one uh, gadget for their activity but in that area in the rural uh, area the people just need to connect to the internet only for two hours or three hours per day and even not every day <laughs> just to get their uh, information that are re- they really need yeah. not all the information or not all those uh, access we are uh, enjoy today so uh, that's the uh, that's the affordability in the perspective of the local people if we can achieve that maybe we can give them uh, 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 the the lowest price or maybe there is no price there because we can share it to uh, other region for example for visa connection if we talk about 24 hours connection it become very high the, the price but if we can share it the bandwidth for example we have 24 hour bandwidth for everybody for may, maybe for a 10 uh, visa station but we can schedule them for in the morning in the region A in, uh, in, the, in the afternoon in another region will connect it we can share those bandwidth in the same price uh, and we can divide the cost to everybody so it's more cheaper and more appropriate to the people because we can still have, we can still deliver the uh, appropriate uh, information to them. But on the other hand, we can cut off the budget. Thank you. Tia, did you want to add to that at all? Okay. Well, just to um, build on, on, uh, on, on what the panelists said already about uh, what needs to be done. Um, I think there's quite a lot of fairly well recognized uh, activities such as ensuring the competitive environment, uh, a vibrant um, mix of of, um, private operators both at the uh, infrastructure level, the telecommunications pipes as it were, internet service providers well interconnected with internet exchange points, uh, policies to ensure that uh, Infrastructure isn't duplicated, such as um, multiple um, masts and roads dug up many times to lay cables. So um, policies which ensure that all new roads that are built have ducts in them, which can then be used by the telecommunications operators to lay their cables, for example. Uh, So on the supply side, I think there are many areas there at a national policy level that can be addressed and are fairly well documented already. Um, one of the things that I thought was quite interesting that came up is I recently visit, uh, vis- visited a very interesting project uh, in Kenya which made me think about um, innovative business models for supplying uh, services to isolated communities. Um, and the approach uh, that the um, uh, internet service provider there has um, taken is to um, kind of create a a franchise co-op model and focus it not so much on on supplying internet but supplying uh, electricity and internet as a byproduct of that and I thought that was quite an interesting innovative model there because you had the buy-in from the community because in many cases with these top-down products projects, uh, they put in the, the solar panels or whatever and, and uh, they get stolen because they're not, they're not sort of a sense, there's no sense of ownership by the community. So this strategy was to uh, create a cooperative 
of the, owned by the village. They decide um, where the connectivity should go, how it should be used, and that's a byproduct actually of getting them basic electrical energy, which is really probably a more serious uh, need in many cases to, as a starting issue. And, and this can very easily be done together these days. So I think that they're innovative business models for supplying services in remote areas that haven't really been well documented or, or adopted widely. Um, I think there was a, a, a person who would like to speak at the back there. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Uh, I'm Nasser Kateni. I'm the CTO for Microsoft in Middle East and Africa. And I, I wanted to kind of relate on an experience we had or set of experiences we had in, in Africa um, on providing, uh, you know, building pilots to provide uh, Internet access, affordable Internet access through different uh, you know, business models, etc. Uh, for example, one, we have one in Kenya where we work with a, a local uh, ISP to, uh, in which we're looking into using technologies such as TV white spaces um, uh, to provide, you know, affordable internet access. We have different pilots running there uh, in different parts of Africa. And, and I totally agree with you that, you know, the model that has always been looked at is, you know, we provide internet, pro internet is provided, and it, you know, it, uh, ISPs are charging for the internet itself. Well, we haven't necessarily looked into the different business models that can be, you know, developed, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, differently. The other thing that we're facing seriously in, in many parts of Africa where we tried these projects, are we, I see two major policy issues that, are face that we're facing. The first one is the, uh, in, in this very specific project, one is around um, uh, frequency allocation. You know, uh, regulators are always looking into ways for maximizing the revenue that they can get in short term out of selling their, you know, uh, the, the frequencies. And eventually what happens is that th those costs, they are then translated back into the consumer side. So if, it, if it's an internet service provider has to pay for, the, for, for those frequencies, the, the end user will have to pay for them eventually. And, and it's interesting that the regulator does not necessarily always look into the long-term benefits of, of you know, serving the communities, but they, they're looking into the short-term of how they get you know, short-term money out of it. So that's an example we're facing from the policy issue. Uh, and the other policy that we have seen, which is in some sense, when I look into it, I can say, yeah, it makes sense. But in, in this very case, it has been uh, difficult is where we, you know, regulators basically are saying you should be basically selling the internet uh, at, you know, same price for everybody. And then, then it's, it's, it, in some cases it might say it makes sense because everybody pays the same, but, but at some point in time when you try to, to reach the affordable people, the, you know, people that cannot afford it, then the, the regulator is actually making policies that, that force the telcos or the in, internet service providers to, to sell at certain price, even if they want to sell, you know, lower. Um, and that's, that's also uh, an interesting experience where we have seen, you know, um, you know, blockers. And so my question is really about how do we, you know, how do we work with regulators and policymakers to understand the long-term benefits of these, you know, of the, the, the regulation and not necessarily, you know, the short-term, you know, things that they can get off, for example, setting licenses or whatever, but looking into the, 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 the long, uh, you know, the longer goal. And it's interesting to really to see, fascinating to see what communities want to get access to Internet, what they do with it. It's, I, I tend to agree what, what you said, you know, just let them. Give them the Internet and you will be fascinated about, you know, how innovation comes from, you know, education, healthcare, agriculture, fascinating. They know, people know how to use it. Just give them. Uh, thanks very much for that uh, intervention there. I think, Bernadette, you may, we were very well placed to talk about how to work with regulators and policy makers. Um, right. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before that the CTU, although we are intergovernmental, <clears throat> we work very closely. We have actually regulators, regulators from within the Caribbean region who are part, who are members of the CTU. And that, uh, as I said earlier, it creates a sort of multi-stakeholder environment in which we do a lot of 
education about the technologies, the implications for development, what it's going to mean as far as regulations, legislations, policy framework, uh, what needs to be done on those fronts uh, to make sure we get the best possible or the most out of the technologies and the whole technological um, uh, evolution. So we do invest a lot in the education of stakeholders. It is an absolute must because to we find in the Caribbean many of our regulatory institutions were set up to liberalize the sector. Now that the sector has been liberalized, what are regulators supposed to be doing? And uh, our view is that we, they should be seeking the best interests of the consumer, so that uh, the end user, so that these short-term gains from the, regu from the regulator's pers perspective must be uh, viewed, we, we, you look at the greater long-term good. And those are the sort of themes and messages that we, we, have, um, we, we, uh, we promote in our interactions with our regulatory institutions. And I just wanted to go back to uh, 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 one point. Community access points, uh, many governments have undertaken to do them, but they have a high, they've had a fairly high uh, failure rate. And the trick is to, uh, you gave an example, linking it with things that are beneficial, linking community access points with economic activity for the community, and that helps. So we've seen very successful community access points. For example, in a community that pr uh, pr uh, produces woven mats, and they've been able to sell those mats globally, or uh, a specific brand of sheep. Uh, uh, well, I don't think you call it brand, but <laughs> what do you call it? sheep? You know, and and you know, promoting the sale using the technology and unique types of garden produce. So if you could link your community access points with economic, the economic activity in the community, it helps with the buy-in. On, on working with government, I mean, I think one thing is governments and regulators are dealing with so many different issues and so many different constituencies. I think one thing that civil society and private companies can do is help them conduct some of the research that they may not have the resources to do in-house, whether it's because they're, they're not staffed up for it or because they are dealing with so many other issues. And so on TV White Space, where, where Google works with Microsoft, you know, one example is we offer spectrum mapping for countries who are interested in learning about if TV white space would work in their countries. And the nice thing about doing this um, simple service for them is that uh, we recently did it for Senegal, for instance, that the regulator then sees, sure, they've licensed out you know, uh, this spectrum for mobile operators and this spectrum for um, broadcasters, but that there's a lot of spectrum that's not being used efficiently because it's not either it's not being used in certain geographies or it's not being used at certain times. And so being able to help the regulator and governments with that type of research, um, I think, is one thing that that we can do um, to to get them to, to see longer term and also see more opportunities than sort of what they've traditionally done. I'm agree with that. Uh, in our experience, we see that what we are forget, uh, what we are forget is uh, uh, in the most area, there's uh, some kind of uh, uh, support system surrounding the, uh, the the community itself. For example, uh, maybe there's a, a, a community. Uh, uh, for example, there's a maybe a private company, and they are willing to share their access to the community, and maybe there's a uh, NGO there, so civil society there. They are willing to help, even that the help is not their core activity, but 
they are still willing to help. Yeah. That one is uh, we uh, miss to assess before we deploy something to the to the to the area. That's the common problem with the uh, government policy also, because they see that uh, in in the, uh, for example, uh, universal service obligation uh, program, they see that everybody is uniform, uh, but it's not. Every community is different, so they have their own life support system. They have their own uh, uh, relation to others. That's what we have to explore more deeply because from those we can see uh, some potential for system reliability. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Tia, do you find much variation between the islands or is it a fairly uniform kind of community environment? Uh, we stick with schools because um, right now we see a great need of uh, communications between the schools. Um, so our our uh, our sense of of that is um, we we want to make sure this uh, well right now the the way they transfer say uh, report cards or timesheets somebody has to physically take a boat to the island and drop off the paper you know so um, that's why we want to work with schools so that um, so that we give them a way of delivering that information to where it needs to go without uh, depending on good weather or you know situations situations like that um, so our goal is to uh, give them a lifeline to communicate regardless of uh, weather and then of course um, see other ways that each of the different communities uh, how they interact with um, either their own uh, people or uh, people close by to their island or people from outside of the state. Um, so yeah, our, our main concern is is to give them a way to communicate uh, really just internally. Um, and then the Internet for us is a bonus. That's, uh, that's uh, how we get them to uh, want the technology. Thanks very much, Tia. Um, I think we've got a couple of speakers here, the gentleman in the middle and then the gentleman over on the left. Hello. Thank you for the discussion. My name is uh, John Walubengo from Kenya. Uh, in East Africa, Kenya is you know, considered one of the most developed in, in, in telecommunication market, both in terms of liberalization, competition, infrastructure, etc. But in the recent ITU affordability index, you find that Kenya is still the most expensive in terms of offering internet. So just listening uh, to the panelists and from the floor, you've given uh, very good suggestions on, on how to bring down costs, you know, competition, which we have in Kenya, uh, infrastructure, we have the submarine cable, we have fiber across the country, we all we have that. You talked about um, things to do with frequency. I know the regulator is working on something called frequency refarming, etc. In short, I find that Kenya is doing all of those things and still the cost of internet is still high. And I'm suspecting it's got to do with what they call a dominant player because one of the operators actually owns like 80% 75 to 80% of the internet market. So maybe from the panelists, what advice can you give? Because it looks like the regulator is almost scared on how to handle this situation. How do we sort of level the playing field without hurting the dominant player who keeps reminding everybody that they worked very hard to get to that position? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Wolfbanger. You've highlighted a very uh, tricky issue there. Um, and in many respects, this, the high cost of Internet access is a reflection of um, the high cost of mobile access generally. And then, of course, the uh, kind of 
pseudo competition that takes place. So you don't really have a fully competitive environment, and you don't see prices changing. Uh, and you have these these dominant operators who invested millions in their networks and uh, uh, instituting um, significant mar market power regulations on wholesale pricing or even retail pricing is a very tricky and difficult as activity for under-resourced regulators. But I don't know if the panel has any further observations. One other thing that we look at is also new technologies that can bring um, internet access. So rather than addressing the current, uh, the, the current structure and, and, you know, doing, in addition to doing all the things you mentioned, which is promoting good policies, um, we look at new technologies. So I already mentioned TV white space. Um, some of you might have heard of one of our projects called Project Loon, where we're looking at developing, uh, delivering access through um, high-altitude balloons. Um, so, and we also invest in others who are looking at new technologies. So, we recently gave a grant to a number of researchers at Stanford and Berkeley who are developing um, some new network technology designs based on software design networking, um, looking at being able to deploy and manage rural networks at a lower cost. Um, so we really hope that some of these new technologies will one day become available so that there are, are um, alternative ways to access Internet and not, not necessarily just through your mobile operator. Thank you. We, we in the Caribbean, we experience very much you know, a similar situation, uh, no real competition. Although the sector has been liberalized, there's no real competition. And uh, in addition, uh, you have duopolies, duopolies, and that really has not affected the, the, the cost. The cost is still prohibitive, especially when you consider on the international connectivity side, there's little competition so that the prices remain artificially high because your international transit is high. I agree with Jennifer 100%. The new technology uh, is the way to go. Uh, I wanted to bring to the attention the, the whole issue of broad, uh, uh, broadband over power lines. And if you have your, your, uh, your utility power, electricity power company, and, and using that technology, you could add a, a third new player to the whole to the whole environment, and that I think is is tremendously powerful. It, it is it is a good um, third opportunity, and we are seeing it. Um, we know that some of the countries in the Caribbean have started looking at making the utility company the next service provider to help in in in. in enhancing or strengthening that competitive environment. Regulatory reform. You said something that was quite instructive. Did you say the regulator might be afraid? Yes. Yes. And, and it, it calls for regulatory reform and a different approach to the whole business of regulation. Uh, the philosophy has to change because the regulator now, not you have to see your primary stakeholder as the end user and seeking their interests. And uh, those sort of, it's a whole philosoph philosophical shift that has to be done because in many cases, as I said, in the Caribbean, the regulators were established to liberalize the sector. What happens now? Right? And that is, those are questions that have to be considered. Yeah, I have another comment, but uh, that the uh, liberalization is not the answer of uh, for the uh, unconnected. That's for sure. Because in Indonesia, we see that uh, after a decade of liberalization, the, the the idea is to give more access to the unconnected, but the fact is they are still out there. Yeah, that's the problem because. If you're talking about the uh, the open market, they they will expecting for uh, some revenue, from uh, some uh, economic of scale. But for those people, they will 
not going there. <laughs> exactly. For example, uh, internet access for uh, end users in Indonesia, for example, if you are using mobile services, are uh, cost uh, five dollar uh, per month. And that's quite cheap in here, because uh, ten years ago you have to pay ten times of that. Now it's become uh, affordable for most people in Indonesia. But for the unconnected, those five dollars still compete with basic needs. You have to understand that. So there is no economic scale forever for them. So we have to have uh, some other way to uh, provide those access to the people. Uh, for example, we have to rely on the uh, government project. We have to rely to the use of fund. We have to rely to the uh, social responsibility fund from the uh, private company and so on. Because without this, uh, uh, we cannot bring the solution to the unconnected. If you are still uh, focus on the uh, uh, investment to the industry, they will never come there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pataka. Yes, um, I think there's been some very good observations in this area, and I'd like to add one here too. Um, I think this area of ensuring that there are other technological alternatives is a key one, and it's a big uphill battle, though, to um, convince policymakers uh, when you have such well-resourced mobile operators who are going to fight tooth and nail to hold on to their franchise uh, and use every means possible, including flying in lawyers from all over the world to uh, convince the regulator and the Minister of Communications that uh, their system is the answer and that they've paid a huge amount for their licenses and their spectrum and that there's no way they're going to let other players into the market. Um, and then I think even when you, when perhaps uh, some chinks in that in that armor are broken through, and, and people are allowed to self-provide Wi-Fi or use TVWS, uh, you also have to ensure that those technologies can fully interface with those existing networks. So again, they will continue to be resistant to allowing these new uh, players access to VoIP gateways and to have their own uh, in-dial numbers or anything like that. So interconnection with the existing networks is key for these small players to actually provide a viable solution because otherwise the, the end users are still going to have to buy services from the mobile operator to, to maintain a voice number and the service from the new technology provided to provide the internet. And it, again, it's not cost sustainable. So we really have to make sure that there's a full path there for people to be able to use a new technology. Um, I think that there's a, an intervention that someone would like to make on the left there. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Toto. I manage a small ISP in Bali. Uh, I'm really interested with the, what is it, the presentation regarding the case of Caribbean and uh, considered as a successful and uh, the community or the people in that area have the improvement quality of life. Uh, I need to learn uh, in more little bit detail how is the, or not how is, but how the improvement is it let's say for example from the year number one when you start the project the indicator of the score of the school children from five and then the next other two years it scores seven for example or the monthly income of a family from one hundred dollar a month jump into three hundred something like that uh, why this is interesting? Because I see a different approach, and maybe you can uh, share how this Caribbean area, uh, given this approach on the internet deployment. While in the case of Indonesia, maybe more or less is about the same. 
We are scattered islands, 17,000 islands, and maybe about 7,000 inhabited. But if you fly from Bali two hours to the east area, even in Sumba or in Flores, there are some districts, uh, the structure of the, the, what is it, the, the government is uh, central government and then the province and district and sub-district. In some of the district in this east area, even there is no internet yet. Even the, the government, there is no internet. Sorry to say, but I would like to share. Uh, while the government approach in the internet deployment to the community or the people in this area is just kind of a project. Why the project? We plan a year before when uh, Universal Service Obligation, IESP, play, uh, pay this, this amount of money to the government and this amount of money is being used for the user project. So they deploy uh, the internet access just on the sub-district. So, for example, if a district has a 15 uh, sub-district, the government just deploy one point per sub-district. Maybe uh, my friend uh, have a good experience on that one. The project contracted for four years. But surprisingly, just only run for one month and stop not running for another 4.10 months <laughs> later okay. uh, many many what is it uh, reasons why they stop it can be the funding or can be the skills but I think the main problem is the approach of the project why if this year Government deploy the the equipment one fees, one or two visa dish and equipment and then two uh, uh, sorry ten or fifteen computers in that area. Let's say this area consists of ten thousand adults people including school. That maybe we assume they need internet connection. What the next problem is? Just compared from 10,000 to just only 15 or 10 terminals computer, they don't even have the buying power to buy the computer or laptop. So even you have a, sta a sustainable internet connection just in that one point, but the people from the remote area, let's say, uh, you know, the, some, some area has a very wide uh, area to cover. It needs maybe by motorcycle takes about three hours to reach this internet access. It's very difficult to provide everybody. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, I need to what is it to know how Caribbean uh, handle this 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 kind of things. While in our experience. I give the services to some of the government in this area. And I, uh, what is it, very happy to visit remote area just because I, my hobby is fishing, so I come to the beach, I come to the remote area to see how, how people live. And I agree with my friend that Internet is not their priority. Let's say, for example... For one day, you have to uh, spend 10,000 rupees or about one US dollar to eat. The cost of the internet access this, with this government facility is about the same. For two hours. Because they're using the facade of KU Ben, which is basically is very sensitive to the weather. So if they come in the rainy season, they pay 10000 and then in the middle it stops, and then it's useless. That's the... the or is it? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the, the picture, this, this uh, what is it, the experience in Indonesia. And of course, if uh, the Caribbean, what is it, project proves uh, successful, I believe the approach is very much different. 
is not. Uh, I assume that this is an integrated approach, not just only bring the visa equipment terminal computer into uh, into the district and then that's it. Yeah. Thank you for the time. Thank you. I, I have to say, first of all, that community access points, they have a high failure rate in the Caribbean. But there are lessons that we could learn from the success stories. And as you rightly said, it's not sufficient just to bring the technology and put it down. Some people would be inclined to experiment, but you still have to introduce the technology in a way that people are comfortable experimenting with it. Um, so the, the big question always with technologies, you provide it, what are you going to do with it now? What is the next step? And this is where uh, I think public awareness and education comes into play. Uh, the CTU, we do a lot of work with um, education and just raising awareness. Sometimes it's just a case of like flicking a light switch so that people could say, oh, okay, I could use this for, and then the imagination takes over and the experimentation starts. Um, there is, you have to engage multiple stakeholders, and as my colleague said, it, is, it has to be a bottom-up approach. You cannot just put it there and expect things to happen. It's not automatic. So you really need to engage at the grassroots level to start with and to educate and to raise awareness and to just to open people's eyes and explain what, why you have put that, why you're, 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 you're planning to put this there in the context of what the community does. And if you could link it to some economic activity, uh, some, some computer access centers provide training for which certification is given, right? And that is an incentive to young people to come and, you know, make the commitment to take advantage of the opportunity to, to be certified. So there are a lot of, you really have to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis because one size does not fit all. And you have to understand the, the soul of the community and what their aspirations are if you're going to design a, 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 an, a, an ecosystem or an environment in which uh, a community access point brings tangible benefits, right? So um, it, it is, you really have to understand your communities and the culture and the people and the things that would drive and motivate them. Uh, Yes, so, so I'd be happy to, to, to talk a little more offline, but I'm certainly going to let someone else say something. <laughs> Tia, I think you want to do um, Yeah, I just also want to share a, a story about um, rural deployments at a place where they have no money. Um, literally, they didn't have any cash on the island, you know, because the bank is on the main island. And uh, currency doesn't really work on those uh, places. And uh, we went out, rebuilt a uh, volunteer to rebuild a, a classroom, turn it into a computer lab, uh, put in a RIC system. Um, af after all the work was was done, we on our last day we decided to uh, demonstrate Skype. Um, so we took out a big uh, white blanket on the field, um, hooked up the computer and fired up Skype. Um, we started calling around the world um, and almost everybody on the island was there um, to, to see this, you know, because they're only used to talking on ham radio to the uh, neighboring islands and they heard you can actually see faces and talk to them. Um, so Almost everybody was there, all the elders, the chiefs, they were there. And the, every time we connect up, um, all the students, the kids, the community, they cheer and, and sing. And um, For us, it was like really amazing, you know. It was, we, we, it was, uh, we took that as an, like, 
just a common thing, but out there it was, I've never seen it before. Anyway, well, actually, I felt that when I walked in and saw Windows 95 back then with the screensaver, I think that's how they felt. Um, and then, oh yeah, uh, one of the elders uh, that was uh, sitting in front of us, he uh, turned back and uh, you could see the emotion is in his face, um, teary eyes, and he uh, came up to me and thanked me and told me that one of the guys on the, the call was his grandson, and he hasn't seen him for over 10 years. Um, and on the project, we we had uh, enough money to pay for six months. Yeah, four no no three months, three months for the for the MRC. And uh, our plan was to talk to the government to pay for it after the the three months. Um, and it's island time also. The three months didn't really kick in. So we were expecting them to be disconnected after three months. But, yeah, guess what? Those people told their relatives off-island to pay for it. <laughs> it was, I don't know, it just we didn't plan it that way. But until now, those people, they're, it's two years now, and their relatives outside pay for that so that they could call home. You know, and uh, after talking to our team, we felt that that kind of made them um, have that ownership. So um, we're we're letting them do that until you know they get tired of paying for it for it themselves, and that maybe look at the government to help help pay for it. And so um, they gotta see the value. They gotta see the value of, you know, the technology, then everything just flows. Thank you. Thanks, Tia, for that uh, wonderful example. Uh, there's, uh, a, there's a gap between the uh, expectation and the requirement of the user program. For, from the, uh, my friend told you that uh, from the user perspective, they just deploy the infrastructure. Yeah, that's the requirement. That's the basic requirement they have to do. Then after they deliver those, uh, they don't care about <laughs> about the uh, how the people engage with that, uh, the, that facility. So we need more uh, program. We need more assistance. We need more uh, work around on those uh, empowerment area. Uh, how we can... Uh, help the people to engage to this uh, facility and then utilize time uh, to benefit their life. And after that, we have to see, uh, uh, we have to help them to find out uh, solution for a, a long time, uh, long term uh, sustainability. Because, uh, as I told you before, that uh, sometimes uh, and often there's a potential surrounding the uh, community for example the uh, uh, for, from the local government then uh, maybe for uh, NGOs or maybe there's a, a major for example in, in Mentawai in, in, the, in the West Sumatra we see that there's a plantation uh, factory there it's uh, in those area they are very rich <laughs> they can pay you uh, for the internet access just for free uh, how much you can uh, how much you want they can just give you all we need is somebody to talk to them that, that who is the to somebody actually we expect the government to do that because if we told them they won't listen to, to us that's the uh, uh, that's the situation in the uh, 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 the common situation in the area uh, thanks, Pataka. I think that's a very good point that's been uh, raised here is that we can't see these public access centers as uh, purely funded by the people who are using them and that they, we must look at uh, alternative funding means, especially in the initial phases, because what can happen is um, 
that the tech new technologies can uh, become available, the environment can become more competitive, and if the price is low enough uh, for the people who use it, then there will be n more and more economies of scale, more people will use them, and the cost can be shared amongst more people, which then kind of stimulates more use and, and lowers the, the price per user. I think another aspect of this, though, is, is to not think of these uh, community access points as purely as a bunch of PCs that give people internet access. I think um, especially in this day and age when there's more and more affordable tablets and, uh, and smartphones, uh, these centers need to be looked at as, as a place for training, uh, for providing ancillary services like printing photos and many other different kinds of similar related uh, um, ICT services, and including um, provision of, of, of access through Wi-Fi to the surrounding community, and in these in these areas where the com population is very distributed, um, TV white space or the Loon project, for example, can um, provide this kind of access over much wider areas than what we're used to right now. So these can be real hubs for for bringing in access on a much wider basis and they can be a starting point for that and I think it's important not to see them just as standalone uh, computer access centers. Um, we're coming quite close to the end of our session now. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, well, if not, um, I'd like to thank the panelists here for a very informative and interesting session and invite the uh, um, participants to give us all a round of applause for a good session. Thank you. Thank you.